Um, so if everyone's able to see my screen, I'll just jump into this. So the topic is about talk tool integration. Um, and uh, as I said, we this started as a project at the Racine plant in CNH. So I'll briefly introduce how this works and then I'll let Mike take over from there. So uh, as we've been talking all day, uh, Pro Planner shop floor uh, execution solutions, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the and on dashboard. We talked about how configured work instructions are viewed at, uh, at Terex just now. Uh, another aspect of the shop floor execution solution is door team. Um, so with us being uniquely positioned to, uh, to know the, the activities being performed at a unit level, uh, at a station uh, operator level, uh, that it makes us uh, the right, you know, right tool or the right medium to communicate that information to the device uh, that the operator is using to to torque uh, torque the unit, uh, torque parts of the unit. Um, so before I get into uh, that particular discussion, just a quick uh, background of uh, of Pro Planner at CNH Industrial. Uh, so we've been CNH is our oldest client. We've been working with CNH since 2006. Uh, we started at the plant in Wichita, Kansas, uh, and now we have grown to over 16 plants worldwide uh, across all the different regions. Um, the key features in use at CNH, um, just a quick run through of those, we, we manage the, uh, the E-bomb, M-bomb relation in, in CNH, so we receive ECOs, we update the M-bomb, we push that M-bomb over to MRP. Uh, we manage change, uh, workflows, so any kind of change, whether it's uh, you know engineering driven or shop flow driven or or ME driven, uh, manufacturing driven. I mean, uh, we manage the workflows of that, informing all the different uh, uh, groups within the organization of of that uh, upcoming change. Uh, of course, we do the process planning at CNA to so creating the uh, the lines, the stations, and the work within those stations. Uh, we are also doing PFEP at CNH at almost all the plants in North America. Uh, so this is planned for every part. We have a presentation later this afternoon, but basically uh, figuring out how to deliver parts to the stations uh, through different uh, you know, delivery methods. Um, we do scheduling at CNH also. So we, we help them with uh, uh, orders from MRP that have not been uh, scheduled yet, we we uh, you know we schedule them on a uh, on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, and, and update MRP again. Uh, I think the reason, just a quick point on scheduling, is the reason we have scheduling uh, at CNH was again with to help with the whole process planning aspect of it. The sooner we know what demand is coming, uh, the better it is for folks who are trying to uh, plan out the month, the year, uh, uh, the quarter. I mean. Uh, and so the more they know about the demand, even though it's not scheduled yet, the better it will be for their plan process planning and especially line balancing. And of course, we're doing time studies and we're generating work instructions uh, for the line. So that work instruction is really the the the, the angle with, that we took for, for talking. Uh, so just a, a history of why we, uh, we were con being considered. Uh, you know, torque accuracy was critical to quality improvements at CNA. So, you know, there was a, there was a push from the CNA side to make sure that uh, the the, uh, the torque parameters are being correctly communicated to the operator to the tool on the line. Uh, we were selected as a part of that communication because we had the knowledge of what the operator is doing at the line, what processes they are following, what tools they're using, what parts they're or parts they're uh, consuming. Um, the next step was to communicate this information to the to the talk tool. Uh, when we started uh, this discussion, um, uh, I think it was a year year and a half back, uh, we were still working. Pro Planner was still working on this talk tool, open protocol, this communication between Pro Planner, Shop Flow Viewer, and the actual device. Uh, and because we wanted to get going at CNH uh, and 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 you know push this information to the tool. We started looking at middlewares. In fact, CNA started looking at middlewares uh, like Pivotware, which is a tool offered by, by a, a company called Disorter that makes uh, torque tools. Uh, and so Propana then partnered with Disorter uh, to make this integration a success for CNA. Right? So that's, that was our first step into the torque tool uh, communication world. Uh, why we were considered as the, the source of this information, um, as you can see, the, the three main things in ProPlanner that, that make it the right fit for, for communicating this information. 
we have activities being performed at, at a workstation, which is the work uh, configured by unit, configured by model, configured by option that the, oper that the, that the operator is going to work on. That configured activity has a set of work steps, has a set of parts, and has a set of tools that they need to consume. Uh, so what basically the approach that was taken was, okay, in a given activity, or for all the talking activities that are being performed on the line, let's go ahead and define the steps that are required for talking. For those steps, let's associate the tools and the parts that are required for talking. And at different levels, at the tool level and the part level, let's define some parameters that we need to communicate to the tool. Uh, mainly mainly the, the program sets, the, the torque values, uh, the angles, the quantity, and so on. So this, you know, this is kind of the background of why we came into the picture of, of uh, communicating to the talk tool. Um, and then from, uh, from there, we took it to, to pushing the data out to, uh, to, to the tool itself. With that, I'll um, have Mike uh, get into the discussion. So Mike, I'll start uh, with the background of CNH Industrial, just those who are not familiar, and then uh, just let me know when I need to move, on, move the slides. Yep. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess, first of all, can you can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Mike. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, as Bondo mentioned, my name is Mike Murray. Um, I work at CNH, where we are a leading global capital goods company with a strong presence in both on and off, on and off highway applications. Um, on the left, you can see some key figures, but basically we offer 12 brands globally, of which for those brands you're probably most fam familiar with are the ones that are predominant in North America, uh, which are the Case IH agricultural brand, the Case Construction Equipment brand, and also the New Holland uh, construction and agricultural brands. Uh, we currently operate about 67 plants glo globally, uh, with 12 of those plants being here in the North American region. Next slide. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, I've been with CNH for a little over 28 years. Um, actually 25 of that has been with the Racine tractor plant. Uh, during that time, I've served in various roles, including process engineer, IE manager, workplace organization leader, focused improvement leader, and uh, assembly manufacturing engineering manager. Uh, though currently I am in the central manufacturing engineering team and I work as the assembly technical expert supporting our North American plants in various things uh, including uh, assembly tooling support, technology products and deployment, uh, product launch expertise, capacity planning and also uh, capital investment support uh, for projects. And on the right there I guess on the you can kind of see a a little picture of the uh, the product, our tractors, uh, the Case IH branded tractor that we produce in the in the Racine plant. All right, next slide. So, from a Racine standpoint, um, we did have an existing MES type execution system in the plant already. Um, we used it more in our component areas, and and we ventured out to see if we could use that in our transmission and tractor assembly areas. Um, Unfortunately, what we found in a, in a small project is that it just didn't support the order configuration for our products, um, which in our, our world, the tractor world, um, every order uh, is basically made up of like somewhere around 50 to 80 top level bills of material. And the system we had just wasn't able to manage uh, those multiple bills of material in the process sequence that we required in order to match our process. So. Um, ultimately, we did some investigation, but what we found is that the, the database structure really was incompatible with how we wanted to be able to process the data. And ultimately, it also had the, the secondary impact with our manufacturing engineers is that not only did we have to maintain our process data in, in ProPlanner um, in order to be able to manage our time standards and our line balancing, uh, but we also had to manage um, and maintain the process data in this other MES system. So um, that kind of led us in another direction. So next slide. So as I moved into central team uh, for quite a few years, I'd been looking for just trying to find a good 
small execution system that we could use for assembly process control that better aligned with the process data um, as it does in ProPlanner where basically we manage it at a station level. Um, but then also one that could manage that, that parsing of the assembly activities based on you know, that model option variant matching um, with any of the vehicle, specific vehicles, bill material configuration. Um, so, so as we dug into that and we searched around, ultimately we, we found um, the DeSouter Pivotware software as a good potential candidate. Um, so we challenged and worked with these guys. So if I'm still a slide back on you, Bondo. Thank you. Uh, so we worked with them and we challenged them a little bit more to see if we could build a process in their system that allowed us to utilize our existing ProPlanner assembly processes, our SOP images, and then really most importantly, our model option data um, that we maintain for each assembly process or each activity within, within ProPlanner, uh, because this really would allow us to um, allow our existing assembly process maintenance to be completed uh, continue to be completed solely in Pro Planner and not really having to do any of it in Pivotware. And that was really was one of my ultimate goals was to make sure that we didn't create, uh, you know, a, a duplication of effort. We wanted to be able to maintain all of our process data in one system. And that would be, uh, and that would be Pro Planner. All right, next slide. So um, as we started to work with DeSouter, um, really one of our first steps was really to confirm that it had the capability to select from a data file a specific orders assembly process data and then execute the appropriate process steps regardless of the process type. And so for the Racine plant, there was really five process types that we were looking to try to integrate um, that, that communication trigger from ProPlanner to the execution side on the shop floor through the uh, pivotware. So the five process types that we were interested in were um, process verifications, um, pick to light processes, tool fastening processes, data entry, and then also the ability to communicate with uh, um, PLC machine controls. So following that verification, um, there was actually several trials and, and we, confirm that uh, it would indeed do what we wanted it to do. And so following that verification, we set forth a pro planner to develop those extra data fields uh, that we needed to support those types of process steps and all of their data points. So uh, Bondo alluded to these, some of these already, but basically we incorporated uh, torque and angle minimums, maximums and target values, um, tool and socket PSAP values and batch count, uh, asset names, uh, PLC and pick to light input values, and also the, uh, the process step type definitions. So all this work inevitably uh, culminated in the creation of a pro planner CSV output file containing all that relevant vehicle data, assembly process data, fastening data, verification requirements, and uh, and information for the SOP image path and file name. Um, and then all this information is displayed for the assembly operator as each unit enters uh, the workstation. So next slide. So this is just kind of a high level view of the system architecture at the plant, how kind of everything works. So um, it starts with our MRP system. Um, obviously it, it kind of transfers the uh, the actual line sequence as well as order data into ProPlanner. Um, and then I'm gonna mix up the, the bullet numbers here a little bit, but uh, inside ProPlanner, really the first thing that happens is obviously the manufacturing engineer on a daily, weekly, monthly basis is updating all the relevant process data based on any ECOs or requested changes that may come through um, and even a line balance data. Um, and once they're to the point where they want to um, basically send that to the shop floor, the trigger for that is a trigger that's already there in ProPlanner, which is the, the publish publishing process. So the manufacturing engineer will then publish 
the work instructions um, at a time that he sees fit. And so then the next step, which is bullet two on here, is the ultimately the creation of the CSV file, which occurs through uh, uh, an SQL job that for us, it runs every night. Uh, but we also have that option of being able to push it manually whenever we need to. So um, what this SQL job does is basically it, it references the last set of published work instructions and then compares it against the status of existing units on the line to only send the data that we need for each specific order uh, to each assembly line's output file. Uh, so once it's there, uh, the pivotware stations on the shop floor will refer to each of those CSV output files as needed as the uh, unit enters the workstation. And then for bullet point five, what it does is as it works through each process, it will go out to the local file share and pull the ProPlanner SOP image for display for the operator uh, at the workstation as he works through his process. All right, next slide. So ultimately this is what it looks like for the operator. This is the DeSuter Pivotware software um, as displayed in the operator screen. And so what you can see here at the top is uh, in the very top center is the units order number. That's the A194297. Directly below that um, is the activity description. And this data comes from the work step field in Pro Planner that is specified by the engineer. Directly below that is the SOP image that is uh, maintained inside the documents tab of Pro Planner. And uh, also doubles as the same image that is used for SOPs and other you know, hard copy type uh, work instructions or even for shop floor viewer. Then as you move over to the right hand side, uh, the five gray boxes, the top one, uh, you may not be able to read, it's the PSET. So that is the, that 37 is the PSET value that Pivotware is reading from that output file and then communicating to, in this case, the SDIC tool controller to execute the fastening processes. Uh, directly below that is the batch count field with a, a batch value of six. Uh, next one down is number of attempts. attempts. That's more of a, a, a DeSuter controlled value. And then below that are the torque and angle boxes. Um, unfortunately, this screenshot's a little bit old, but in, in today's version, uh, we provide references to the min target and maximum values for torque and angle. Um, and that is basically it, but basically, um, what we have in Pivotware is a, a standard set of processes that each station uh, utilizes in order to be able to read the data from the output file and trigger the appropriate step type, depending on whether it's a fastening step, verification step, pick to light, or um, you know, scanning, or or the other uh, or the other item. So um, that is basically it for me. I will pass it back to you, Mondo. Great. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about is where we are heading as um, in terms of communicating directly to the tool. Um, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, you know, when we started at CNH, we didn't have this piece developed in uh, we had to go through a middleware like Pivotware uh, for the communication, but this is something that we are actively working on. Uh, we are trying to directly use uh, the, the Torque Tool Open Protocol to communicate uh, our talking instruction or talking details from the ProPlanner Shop Pro Viewer to uh, the tool. Um, and I, if Dave, if you're on, do you mind uh, talking a little bit about this? Yes, I can do that. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, concept is just very similar to what you saw. You know, Pivotware is obviously um, has a pretty rich command set. In fact, Open Protocol, which is a standard uh, interface to talk to Torque tools, 
has many commands. Um, in our first iteration, we're really supporting these basic commands, um, which in, is essentially to enable the tool, to disable the tool, to set a parameter set, which is essentially a torque profile, uh, and to set a job ID to get a tool status, uh, which uh, basically says, is the tool available or not? And then to get data about the success of the last uh, tightening event, uh, which is essentially um, two things. One is success or fail, and the other one is a data set related to what the uh, parameters that the tool saves for the tightening event. So uh, obviously enable and, and disable tool uh, are outbound events and whether the tool is enabled or disabled is the tool status event. So those are pretty, pretty hopefully simple to understand what those mean. And those of you who don't know what torque tools do, um, I mean, you, you may be familiar with the concept that you can make a bolt tight, but what a torque uh, profile may look like is, is could just be getting to a certain amount of torque and then moving an angle beyond that. Uh, it could also involve moving to stepped up torque. So I might go to 30 foot pounds, then I might go to 50, and then I might go to 80, and then I might add 30 degrees on top of that. So my point is, is that a torque isn't just, you know, setting your tool to a particular value. Uh, and that's what, what hap basically is, is happening when we have these tool sets is that the each tool kind of has this command set that it knows uh, how to perform. Now the tool is programmed directly with these tool sets. ProPinder's job is really just to allow the process engineer to take that tool set ID that's already stored in the tool, such as torque to 30, then 50, then 80, then go 30 degrees. Uh, that might be referred to as tool set 12. So the process engineer would say, I want this bolt and this activity to be bolted using tool set 12, okay? So that when um, that activity is now active, uh, ProPiner will tell the tool, uh, are you enabled, right? If not, it will enable the tool, it will set the tool set, and then it will wait for the tightening events response. Uh, was the tightening event successful or did it fail? Now, the important thing to note is that per our implementation, uh, success or failure is determined by the tool itself, okay? ProPiner isn't making the decision. Um, the tool knows whether it did or didn't accomplish that uh, torque event. Um, that information, of course, will be communicated. And then as we looked at in a prior presentation with regards to the Andon system, if we're unable to establish that torque event, uh, we do allow the operator to try again. That torque event can't be established, then uh, we will set that alert to fact or to the shop floor viewer. In addition to if the event is successful or if the event has failed, the tool can send us data. Now we don't necessarily, we don't interpret the data. It's just a data set now. Obviously every tool has a different data set it can send us uh, that includes the parameter data that it stores about its attempted torque event, whether it was successful or, or not. And we can store that with that serial number units activity that the operator is signed in on as part of the information that we store uh, about processes that are performed live uh, in the workstation. So the shop floor viewer is obviously the operator signed on. We know who the operator is. We know the serial number of the unit they signed on. We know the date and time they signed on and the operator signs off. But anything the operator does that gets collected during that process, if the operator is entering data values, if the operator is scanning serial numbers of units, or in this case, if the operator enacted a tool set and a tool responded with a torque value that it achieved, that data set is stored uh, as part of that uh, sign on and sign off event for the operator for those activities. So engineers could go back later and mine that information provided they understand you know, the language of data that's sent from that tool. So these are very base open protocol features. <laughs> the feature set for open protocol is very rich and a tool like Pivotware, um, which is uh, a MES application, you know, it's written specifically to focus with its disorder tools. It has a much richer parameter command set user interface, but 
Uh, the nice thing about what we're enabling here is it's at least uh, letting us uh, for those events where really all you're wanting to do is to enable the tool, send a tool set to the tool, get a response of success or failure, store the value and go on to the next event. Um, in that case, for the type of situation for any tool that supports this open protocol, which is pretty standard, uh, you may not need a, a middleware application such as Pivotware. So.